First, let me just uh, say thank you so much for inviting me to be, you know, to to be able to show my work with the audience, to share my work uh, with the audience in Michigan, and um, you know, and this yeah, like you said, it was so helpful to talk to you during this whole last year, to go through to try to understand what's going on, and you know, with all these very complex issues, you know. Uh, happening in America, in the world. There was so much for us to talk about. It was very helpful. So thank you also for that. And uh, um, um, yeah, so I, you know, I grew up, like you said, um, you know, during the late Cultural Revolution in, in China, as I went to the art school there, and that was uh, sort of uh, the beginning of, uh, you know, sort of liberalization of culture in China, art in general. So there was a lot of excitement, you know, the first year, we were the first year student after the Cultural Revolution, very chaotic, destructive time. And, uh, you know, that was the first year, like the student, there were, most colleges were all closed during that time. Mm -hmm. And so I was very fortunate enough to be, to be able to go to a college, you know, even at that time. And uh, so, um, Deng Xiaoping was taking over the power. There was a general sense of finally we put behind like Mao's era behind us, like all oh, we can like doing some, you know, work doing making art. And, you know, um, most of my teachers, quite a few of my teachers were uh, during the Cultural Revolution or even before that, you know, there was a really uh, repressive uh, period even before the Cultural Revolution that uh, they were inviting, I think the government was inviting intellectuals to criticize, to improve, and the people believed it. And uh, when people did, and they were actually being prosecuted and being sent away to kind of in the remote countryside to reform. So um, when I went to school, a lot of these, my teachers came back to the academy to start teaching. And so there was a general sort of restoring some all this time they have lost. And um, these people were maybe 20 years, you know, was not able to do what they wanted to do. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, by the time they came back, it was already there in their 50s or something. Mm. So we, I think that was a very important lesson for, for when we already know, like, the sort of through understanding what they went through, we I think my generation in general have learned a very dark lesson. So um, in terms of the possibility, like how basically a generation of artists are being kind of a silenced and being not able to do what they want to do. So, um, um, so how does that tie in? I mean, when I look at your work, certainly I see it. I see that idea definitely communicated, but then when you, came to the U.S. and like what was how was that different and how do we see that now in in your work yeah, too? So I um I think the the their experience have a lot to do with the, my decision to come to the U.S. actually mm. yeah um because um you know I don't want it to because um when before I came out the the political situation were becoming like a more restrictive again, you know, mm -hmm. they have this sort of uh, pulling back. You know, the during I was in school, it was more liberation, more kind of drawing of all these, uh, uh, you know, restrictions. But now, but then maybe four or five years, I think maybe six, seven years later, things have starting to, you can see the parameter where, you know, the the intolerance maybe of or the things that's not allowed is is being more pronounced. Maybe I think within the government there were people talking about this went too far, and you know, um, and of course when I came, after a few years I came to the states, that's when Tiananmen uh, happened. You know, mm -hmm. 1989, and uh, 
I think this this was like a, a huge struggle within the government in terms of political like a reform or not, right? So the student was very much want to have a democracy more like opening up and there were forces within the government wants to maybe allow more economic reform, but less and uh, not so much of a political reform. So they were, I think, genuinely kind of freaking out about what's happening in Eastern Europe and in, you know, the Berlin Wall kind of came down at that time and Soviet Union was uh, disintegrating. And I think it's genuine, maybe fear, right? It's, okay. uh, mm. I think the, so that was kind of my generation, um, you know, the, there were this sort of yearning for more opening up and then it was, you know, maybe not possible at that time. Right. Okay, uh, so we have images that we want to show our, our, our guests this evening. And I think we should start with the village win, right? I mean, mm -hmm. because we have several images from um, that you have made that sort of concern the village win. And I think this idea that um, sort of permeates through your work about displacement and uh, tradition, right? Or mm -hmm. the traditions that may be lost and the and how and how that plays out in your work is somewhere that I think we should start certainly, um, especially because I was thinking today someone asked me about the paper that you use, the type of paper. Mm -hmm. And certainly yeah. this is a type of paper that is used in classical, Chinese landscape painting. So sure. let's let's show show um, that image of the village when, and then we can kind of talk about. Sure. Um, talk, thank you. Talk about this. This one is is drought and village when, and it has a narrative attached to it. And I think that one of the things we've been talking about is how um, some of these works don't not all of these works really have this sort of uh, narrative element as far as having the characters included, right? But here you're, you're giving voice to something, giving voice to maybe a people that um, we haven't, that have been voiceless, that have been per deliberately silenced, right? So can we talk? Can we talk about the Drought and Village when? And I know we have an audio clip. Do you want to talk about that first or would, um, would you like to play the, sure. because I think you did really a good job there. Okay, we'll go and do that. Click that. Yun Fei Ji, Drought in Village Wen, created in 2013, watercolor and Xi'an paper and silk. According to the elders in Village Wen, many villagers starved to death during the Great Leap Forward. People could hear the ghost cries along the roads around the village even during the daytime. Villagers were afraid of leaving their homes. Then someone said that anyone would be scared of the village secretary, including the ghosts, if you said his name loudly enough. This solution proved effective. Some people in village women were not willing to emigrate to cities for work. They farmed fish and worked in the fields. There was a big drought in Yerajan Mao. Upstream, there was not enough water for the farming of fish, so the villagers had to pull the fish cages tens of miles downstream. In June, it began raining nonstop, and the river's water level soared. The fish, which the villagers had been cultivating for three years, all suddenly died. Yun Fei Ji, 2013. Thank you. So that's my voice, I guess. <laughs> and um, so I, I appreciated I appreciated having the text, right? And having this element. And I really appreciated you even encouraging me um, to be the voice. But I connected so deeply with some of the, these works that had the narrative, um, as hopefully I think people can tell by my, my maybe dramatic, dramatic reading. But um, that's, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about 
the village one, how this got started and, and, and why it continued to be a subject that, yeah. that you um, explored? First of all, you know, when I was a kid, I was, uh, I was kind of brought up by my grandmother in the south, village in the south. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of things happened there and uh, b before I was 10. So it was a kind of me as a kid exploring a village. And then um, I spent, uh, I think it's since uh, 2011, I was back in China for six years um, after spending 25 years, something in the United States. And um, I sort of because my father was house, I was back there for a while. Um, and um, there were um, just all these villages are keep disappearing. And because there were not enough people, you know, people, able-bodied people left to work in the city. And mm -hmm. there were only, so literally a lot of these villages were maybe three villages all of a sudden become one village, all these other villages disappeared. In fact, the village that I grew up in disappeared. So I also for, you know, I did a very big project of Three Gorges Dam mm -hmm. relating to this, uh, you know, hydroelectric project in China, largest in the world. And also the sort of effect of displacement of the people, 1.5 million people being displaced and scattered all over China. And um, I actually for the sort of hydroelectric, hydro dam idea, but it for is not these mega projects. They were very destructive environmentally and forever changing. And it was a huge debate during that time uh, about you know, whether to build or not to build this uh, huge dam because uh, you know, and now after all these years, you can even the idea of uh, preventing like flood it was still a, a big question because a lot of, you know, there was still a lot of flood afterwards. So um, I went, you know, I would sort of, that's a, I went personally to a few times to, to this area to collect information and to kind of see for myself. And then um, later, just around 2011, around that time, there was also another huge project to getting the Yangtze River, the south, they're building this canal to Beijing to the north, a thousand mile canal to getting the water to the very drought, um, kind of dry northern China. And um, for that reason also, there was a quite a lot of villages being, have to move away, uh, sort of a mandatory. So, you definitely, I, I went to see that and document that. Definitely was uh, very much um, very, you know, the local people pay a very high price mm -hmm. for, for these projects. And, um, and in general, like, it just feels like as a way of life, you know, all these years of um, economic development in China mm -hmm. is so focused on the urban, you know, the skyscrapers, the, but actually, the rural China is the one is is really paying a heavy price, right? For that, and uh, you know, for every building building up, there's a huge or few huge, you know, pits and holes and in the rivers and for the sand for the you know cement, you know, all the resources people just have to, you know, you know, uh, getting from the rural area. So I feel. Uh, I, I wanted to focus some of my scrolls, um, my stories like surrounding like so, a sort of a fictional village. And the right. you know, so village when, when is like my fictional village where I put some of my personal knowledge with things that I have studied mm -hmm. and uh, wrote these stories. Mm. I feel like my work a lot of time is kind of misunderstood. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's have to do with the fact that I, um, I use a very much this um, uh, strategy of, of sort of a detour. Um, so when people see a material that's, um, you know, ink and paper, they're already thinking maybe have to do with 
you know, like, you know, like I like to detour something, maybe echoing the, the sort of a deep, long past, but in a way putting perspective of what we're going through today mm-hmm. in a kind of a perspective, you know, in a kind of um, create some kind of attention. So I'm interested in very much of, um, you know, maybe also like I detouring stories in China, but actually I'm talking about America. Mm. And, you know, like in the past, I, <clears throat> you know, when 9-11 happened and, you know, there's a lot of uh, Islamophobia and a lot of fear and people reporting on each other as terrorists, maybe. And I was uh, using this uh, story of China called, uh, it's an um, old story about a ghost, mm-hmm. uh, mistaking each other as ghosts. Uh, you know, two people were fearful of each other and in a rainy day and one each thought the other one is a ghost because they were encountering in a very strange way and uh, eventually it was a laugh or they were not a ghost but one pushed the other into the river you know because he's so fearful Mm -hmm. and uh, it's a sort of a humorous story but uh, sort of like detouring to China to kind of talk about the fear in America at that time. <clears throat> I think a lot of times people miss that. <clears throat> Even curators sometimes miss my intention, I really feel. And, um, you know, now it's sort of, we kind of, this heavy history of um, this phobia, Islamophobia, now it's a Sinophobia after, mm. you know, Trump was this, all this China virus and things. And it's, you know, xenophobia and the sort of nationalism, nativism against like immigrants and sentiments and things like that. So I, I am, you know, all these are my ways to, you know, really, you know, even since the 2002 Winnie Biennial, I was commenting on British colonialism and, and, uh, you know, so I'm kind of, very much responding the best I can to the condition that I was living uh, in America or, you know, like the Katrina, the sort of, you know, governmental failure to protect its citizen. And, and in China, like the, the idea, the, the ideology of progress mm-hmm. um, as a name to kind of really, um, you know, a lot of people really feel like they had to sacrifice themselves when really they can, they have hardly any luxury to sacrifice themselves for the so-called collective good, you know? So the suffering of the people, and then the people are so smart using these excuses, these, uh, you know, to, you know, oh, you need to sacrifice your little small home for the big home, you know? Mm. But when they're really suffering, who is going there to help them out, right? It's So I'm really feel like all these, I see all these really things that really troubles me and really kind of bothers me. And then I'm trying to think about it and make work from that, you know? I'm, that is sort of my process and also, you know, a lot of times I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just drawing or something. And uh, so many, many drawings of my work, I started to piecing them together and mm-hmm. start to see a narrative of connecting different things together. And, um, um, you know, I also, I read newspaper and I read, um, you know, every day, I'm trying to, I'm a kind of a news junkie. Mm -hmm. And so all the things that I read uh, will sort of feeds into my stories as well. You see, like, you know, like all this, um, like the, this uh, fish story you just read, it was uh, something actually happened. And it was, um, you know, some, you know, I say after it rained, the fish died. It was actually, like toxic material stored by the river oh. so actually toxic material went into the river that's why the, the fish died and but i you know i was but you can see like my 
a lot of my materials coming from everyday life, from my, from like things I read, uh, newspaper, blogs, and things, what people are going through. And um, it's really what's really bothers me, it seems right. to me. Right. I mean, so basically what you're saying is like this energy that we're seeing, this intense emo emotional energy is really mm -hmm. about an urgency that you, you, yeah. you feel uh, in response to these situations that you read. I think that that, that makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you read some of these things in the newspaper or you listen to the news or you read the news, you are, I mean, it's, it's kind of it those are there's so many intense situations and for me i think like how do people come back from that and i feel like that's a question that you really do pose in the in in these works a lot um can we move on to the next slide because we have a detail of another piece called um when from the north and i was thinking while you were talking mm -hmm. you say you know wind and water there's a lot, the wind and water is a protagonist in your works a lot, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, they're just as much a character as the people themselves. Yeah. And I, I thought to myself like, oh man, I, I need to maybe reconsider <laughs> a little <laughs> I, bit uh, more. I um, made a show, so uh, I'm, I'm curious about that. When you, you started talking about the layering, I was like, oh my goodness. You know, I had a little light bulb when you said that too that it's not just the people that are the protagonists that we see that, you know, it's easy to sort of focus on the people and the gripping emotion that you see in their faces, right? But like when I look at this, these images um, and, and think about the titles even, like Wind from the North, Midnight Sudden Wind, um, you know, and, and think about some of the narratives also that are affiliated, the elements are just as much as just as much um, protagonist and and or having being impacted by man too in in some yeah. ways. So I'm I'm really curious about how you how you're able to layer all those different stories and and somehow you make them work. <laughs> the wind for me is a, a sort of a standing for um, sort of invisible power of the po government policy actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, it's uh, invisible yet it's uh, affecting our lives in a very fundamental way. And uh, uh, you know, it permeates everywhere, but it's when it's wrong, it, it can really destroy people's lives, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, a lot of my metaphors, like, uh, you know, I did a show called uh, Water That Supports the Boat Can Also Overcap over cap It overturn it you know mm. so you know water is such a fundamental element in our lives we are like you know 95 percent water or something high percentage we are made out of water and uh, water also you know in some of the poetry that i read it's like standing for people you know mm -hmm. I mean, and it's a life force, right? Water is, force. water sustains and then water can also take away. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, the Chinese uh, word for common people is called old 100 names. Because, you know, in China, 1.4 billion people, we have mostly 100 surnames, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so... I actually titled one of my show called Old 100 Names. Oh, well, we've been talking about sort of this intense emotion, but then there's another side. There's another another side to this coin, right? Mm -hmm. um, that I feel like is a part of it. There's also this sort of resigned, um, resigned emotion, but also a resilience that I think that you depict a lot in, in these images. There's just as much happening, right? Mm. But the people are still, they're like resigned to what has happened, but the will to survive still remains, right? And I think that that's an important part of the narrative that you're telling overall with your story, with, with mm. your work, right? Is that these things are happening to people and they're terrible, but then there's this hopefulness, I think, that you inject. Mm -hmm. if, if people I, are paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I was uh, visiting 
the three gorgeous dam area. You know, it looks like uh, all the buildings were torn down and, you know, people were still carrying on their daily lives to buy vegetables for the day. And, you know, I was so amazed how people were able to carry on their daily life in amidst all this turmoil and these huge, you know, basically when you look at where people are living, it's just, you know, you, it's all broken parts of buildings and, you know, so I, I do think that people are like water. They, they just, you know, keep on going, you know, so. Mm. Yes. So I, I had this question and that we, we hadn't talked about um, because I've been observing this. You do this thing in your works where you have groups, mm. some of these clusters, right? So here in Before the Long Journey, you see clusters of packages, but the people are spread out, right? Mm. And then in, uh, in other places, you see clusters of people and then the, the people are or the, the, the packages and the belongings are uh, more spread out. So I, I want to talk about like, is there something symbolic when you, in, in the composition when you do those, those sort of clusters well, and groupings? Yeah, I don't really have any really, um, you know, I, I group them together when I feel like maybe they can help each other out, you know? Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I'd like to move on to the next image, couples, okay. the couples. And so this is another image. Like they're just, they're, they're surrounded by belongings, presumably their belongings. And I'd like here, you know, the S. There's, there are two people clearly evident here, but then the couples, they're, they're couples throughout the scene, right? The belongings mm -hmm. in some place are, are paired mm -hmm. together in couples. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the the tone of, of these works, again, like I said, there's this, okay, resignation, this is where we're at, but they're still there, right? This is the this is one of the ones where I, I don't really see any any of the ghosts here. These are just people with their belongings but they're still here. There's still, there's still this will to survive. Um, and I think that that really leads us very nicely into your latest works, which are really about survival, but like not in the, the uh, way of presenting like, this is what happens when, this is what happens, you know, is happening, like the, the sort of migration, the, the processes of migration and, and moving, right? These are very active images that are like, this is a fight, we're in a battle. <laughs> and um, I want to move on a little bit to some of the, the new works, because one of my favorite works is coming up, the nativists and the immigrants. Um, if we can go on to the next one. And then I wanna zoom in and do that detail shot because you know how much I love that tiger. He's so crazy. <laughs> He's a crazy tiger, but but like this, this brings up the humor because we haven't touched on humor in your work too. And so we can talk about it, talk about that. I think we should talk about that a little bit. There's a little um, irony um, and, but also there is humor in, in this work. And I remember you telling me about the um, better to be eaten by a tiger than to have bad government and, and right. tell and reminding me that remind telling me of that. And I thought like, wow, but look at all these other people, they are grouped together and how they're grouped together and, and what's happening. So I'm kind of, I, I want to, want you to talk a little bit about sort of the irony and, and um, you know, humor that you're injecting into to your work also. Yeah, the tiger, I, you know, I thought about the, you know, Confucius, uh, the old story of he um, was, you know, he was uh, traveling with his students, try to get these warring states to adopt his more humane way of managing the government. And of course he was very, nobody really, everybody rejected him almost. He came upon this um, in the mountains, 
and he came upon this old lady crying on the grave and asking, he asked her why she was crying. And she said that her third son have gotten hurt, got eaten by the tiger. And Confucius was asking her, why is your family not moving to the town at the, at the end, you know, at the bottom of the mountain? She said, she's like, no, oh, no, no, no. We would rather live in the mountain uh, than to go live in that terrible place in the town. And it's being run really badly and it's really, you know, she would rather. So then Confucius reflect on this and says to his students, you see, people would rather eaten by the man-eating tiger than live in a bad government to face the bad government. Mm -hmm. And that's, ever since then, this tiger, for me, representing, you know, something of that story, so. Right. So there are other, there are other protagonists because we touched on the ghosts a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And can we talk about sort of these hybrid figures? They're somewhat humanistic, right? But they're also animals. Um, and what you're doing, what you what you're doing with those those characters, and and what you're trying to say by it by sort of employing these um, hybrids, right? They're hybrids, yeah. I guess we can call them. Yeah, you know, my sources are you know East, some are from China, some are from you know like George Orwell. I really enjoy reading his novels. You know, Animal Farm. He has a talking pig, and and uh, you know. A dictator, you know, and uh, walking, you know, straight, and so I sometimes I including a pig in my work as well. Right, so, yeah. right. I did this work during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I really love to. My wife and I like to go to nature to take a walk and to explore some of the really beautiful parks and you know, areas in Pennsylvania. At the same time, I, you know, there was one day we got lost and it's getting dark and we were, you know, and there was all these signs, hunting related signs. And it was quite, quite interesting, you know, quite, you know, kind of a little frightening. Mm -hmm. uh, try to get out of the tri trail and get back. And, and also, you know, in rural Pennsylvania, we really stood out and I really stood out. And, uh, you know, so, you know, the really suit is referring to maybe a desire to kind of blend it in, but you couldn't, you know? Right. And, yeah, and also, you know, it just, uh, the, you know, this sort of, and you know, Asian hate, you know, all this, like, you know, the sort of uh, xenophobia is like really prevalent and it's getting worse. and. So the general sense, and also at the moment, I know you remember um, now, you, it feels like such a distant past already. But at that time, we really don't know where the country is going to go. You know, right. it was such a uncertainty about the future, right? It was, it was a very unsettling, uh, right. you know. We don't know if a civil war is going to break out, like we don't know what's going to happen. And so I think it's, was a lot of uh, anxiety and a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, right it was so it's, it's really very very personal right right you know, yeah I mean I think you're absolutely right I I knowing a little bit about the area you know I I um grew up part of the the time in Pennsylvania and you could really stick out depending upon where <laughs> you were I mean I I remembered yeah. being kind of in a uh, culture shock as a sort of city kid and knowing that people could take off a week to go hunting, you know, mm -hmm. from school, like that was yeah. exposed. And, 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 or seeing people walk around in camouflage and, and what that means, because when you see people, depending upon the space they inhabit, and that's a, that's another thing we haven't touched on is the space that's being mm -hmm. inhabited in these, mm -hmm. in your work, right? right? Depending upon the space in which these protagonists inhabit, like yeah. their identity has to sort of, there's a sort of shift, right? Yeah. The image itself is like very, um, 
I have I feel for the 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 this this man. I do, but I also feel unsettled by it. And I think you've mm -hmm. captured that unsettling, the unsettling uh, that one feels when you feel like you have to shift your identity based off of the space that you mm -hmm. inhabit and mm -hmm. what that means to you psychologically, yeah, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah it's so um, <laughs> go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Um, no, I mean, I think that you you do. Like one of the comments that someone has says, is, it says this, Yunfei is truly an artist with soul. And I think that that's the, the thing that I see in each of the, the people, right? Like they could, someone could easily write off that the 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 folks are like looking at the people and say, oh, that's not just those those are those those features are nondescript. It's not like an accurate rendering of a of an individual that they know, right? But there's something that you imbue in um, the works and the people that like you you see you see their humanity you see it and it's it's hard not to have an emotional response in my opinion that's my opinion um to the work when i see it i'm like oh my goodness like how again i it's the, the thought that crosses my mind consistently is how do we how do we survive but how do we survive together you know and in that sort of solitary space that you show, yeah. you know, it's a little, it's like, oh goodness. I remember you saying there's like an, an alien, feeling alienated when you have to sort of fit it, do that sort of assimilating and trying to fit in, um, which I think is really important for, for people to think about, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this, uh, this character, this protagonist, he shows up in another image that we have for people to, to look at too, which I love this image. Um, the next image, please. Oh, okay, we didn't we didn't show the man with the dagger. I'm so sorry, good friends. You didn't get to see our man with the dagger. Um, but yes, I love him. He's He is, but he seems so weary too. You know, mm -hmm. I look at that and I said, oh, he's tired. <laughs> You know, still yeah. a you know, just I feel like there's it's a, such a tragedy when something like the pandemic happened, where we're all going through globally um, this terrible situation together, where we should have all more compassion with one another, and yet, you know, politicians are trying to drum up hate of each other, and this is the most, like you know, most, you know, like whether it's groups of people or borders or ideology, it's very unfortunate that we can like work together to really, you know, especially when we're all, you know, the whole planet is facing a big trouble and, you know, we're still like fight over these, you know, I think it's, um, it's really, unfortunate situation. No, I think you're absolutely right. This was a, we, 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 I think might have been presented with an opportunity to um, coalesce around this common, this common germ that we were fighting, right? We were all fighting it together. Everyone was in this sort of fight for our lives. Like, you, you know, I said this today that your work for me is has really captured the essence of the sort of metaphorical fight mm -hmm. for one's life and survival, but also the physical, these new works, the physical fight, the protesters. Like, yeah, the protesters, you know, the gas masks and, and you know, and uh, young people. And yeah, I do really feel like how interesting after all these years, you know, the, the younger generation are like on the streets, right? It's, it's interesting after, you know, like when we were young, we were on the street and now you see the younger generation on the street as well, so. Right. Um, I mean, but, that, but this is the thing. I thought it was really interesting how masks showed up in your, in, in your rendering, right? Because mm -hmm. here, you could have easily taught, 
thought about the face masks that we've all been wearing, these cloth masks, the, the, the sort of medical masks, but you really took it up to the next level and said, no, I'm going to put on this whole mask that you need to survive. Mm -hmm. And also it disguises your face also a bit. I feel like when you, you, you know, regular face masks, you get to see people's eyes and, and may start to recognize, but there's this level of anonymity that you, you kind of get and yep. it's a safety measure. I think you were you were talking about earlier too. We, mm -hmm. We've been or we've been talking about it being a safety measure to have a level of anonymity. Sometimes when you're going to these protests because of what has been happening, and this isn't just you know, um, this is everywhere. I think right mm -hmm. that we've seen that at these protests that people have been injured. There have been really serious consequences that have that have happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one of the things I, I know that we've been, we also have been talking about is the sort of intersectionality of the work. I think it's, we've hit home over and over again today, talking about global events, talking about not just um, current events or past events that happened in China, but here in America, I mean, in England, it, I mean, all over the world, just these sort of different things that have been happening. You could even talk about the, the refugee crisis in the Middle East if, you, if, we, if we start to really sort of expand the dialogue because we see migration happening, forced migration happening globally. Yeah. We see protests happening globally and therefore different different things, but they're basically situated in the fight for human rights, yeah. the fight for survival, the mm. fight to live. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, your work speaks to how we need to be thinking about um, the world right now. Like it, it's a, it's a really strong visualization of the world right now. And I do think that there's hope hope in hope in the work i really do mm. i think that i see you saying like we need to if you present it it's better to present what's happening right than to try and cover it up because we've seen what happens when you cover up yeah. bad things yeah. right it it eventually can fester and then it boils over yeah. so i think um what i see mostly about your work is really it being a call to action um, Very much, you know, coming from a perspective of immigrant that myself is an immigrant and I um, also my work is very, migration is a very important theme for my work. And I feel like it's very, like it's a topic that I feel like I can really, you know, sink my teeth into and uh, talk with, with some knowledge and, and uh, you know, because I feel like it's such a, a contemporary phenomena and we all have to move from one place to another place for survival reasons, for whatever reasons, to find job or to kind of re, reinvent ourselves and to kind of um, be the stranger, be the observer, you know, like, you know, being a the perspective of an immigrant is that you are on the margin and you are very much of an observer of the norm of the place and the culture of the place. And so very much I feel like it's from that kind of place of strangeness and a place of, uh, you know, to kind of um, even when I go back to China, I would still feel like China has moved on and I am looking at from this very weird perspective and there was a lot of things in pop culture I have missed and I had to kind of uh, re-familiarize what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I feel like it's a very strange place. It could very easily happen that I could be, you know, try to sit on the two stools and I can fall in between the two stools and sit on the floor instead, you know? <laughs> so um, very much, I think it's, um, it's a place of discomfort, but yet it's, I think it can be also productive too. Mm -hmm. 